What's up? What's up, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of Part of the Problem. I'm Dave Smith. He is Robbie the Fire Bernstein. How you feeling today, Rob? I like this. I like going live. This is Me fun. too. There's a different energy when you go live. You know, can't say all that horrible racist stuff we normally say and then edit out. <laughs> of course, we are live uh, all always at partoftheproblem.com. That is where you can get the episodes live, ad-free, uncensored. Um, and of course, you can support the show. Plus, you get the members-only episodes on Thursdays. So please, if you can, make sure you go over and help support the show at partoftheproblem.com. There's a whole bunch of different levels you can sign up for and a whole bunch of different goodies that you get at the different levels. And all of that stuff by the way is kicking off soon with um the people at the the higher levels the zoom shows and all that stuff we're going to start doing uh um in the next week so thanks to everybody who signed up already and to the rest of you you're dead to me and don't talk to me anymore or just go go sign up if you could that'd be cool all right, and I should mention before we start getting into things that the day after tomorrow, Thursday, me and Rob will be out in Stamford, Connecticut at New York Comedy Club. I know it's a little confusing because the club is named New York Comedy Club and it's in Connecticut, uh, but the people who owned the New York Comedy Club in New York opened a club in Stamford. I, I couldn't tell you why it's not called Stamford Comedy Club, but they are great guys who own that club and I've heard nothing but good things. So I'm excited to go there. There's a few tickets still left for that. If you want to come. And then of course we'll be all over the road, comicdavesmith.com for all of me and Rob's uh, uh, dates together. And then uh porch tour.com is where you can go to find all of Rob's uh, summer porch tour dates, which are now evidently not just a summer thing anymore. So that's big news. Anything else uh, you want to mention, Rob? Check out run your mouth. Yes, of course, Rob's other uh, fantastic podcast, Run Your Mouth. Also, thank you to everybody. The, my episode with Tucker just dropped uh, a few hours ago, and I've been getting a very nice response from the internet. So thank you, internet. I appreciate you for being so good to me. That was a real, real fun one. Uh, it was one I, for sure one of my favorite podcasts that I've ever done. Uh, I just love talking to Tucker Carlson. Super, super interesting guy and really great guy. Um, okay. So where do we start? Why don't we talk a little bit? Did you watch, uh, or did listen to, uh, any of the, uh, the Twitter space X space with Donald Trump and Elon Musk from last night, Rob? I listened to about the first 15, maybe 20 minutes. And then I skimmed through a transcript. Hmm. There you go. I was, um, dare I say low energy. <laughs> Low energy Trump. Well, uh, I, I thought it was good. I from what I skimmed the topics and everything was kind of on point. Um, I think at the end of the day, Elon Musk actually is not a broadcaster. And so yeah. I think if you put Trump with like, you know what I mean? I, I can't do any of what Elon Musk does. I can't build a rocket. I can't tell you what Tesla is. I can't. Work That's for mine. sure. I can't get kids to mine in Nigeria. <laughs> I, I can't do these things. I don't know how to do it. But I do know how to broadcast, so I think partly that is when you're seeing people. And there's something interesting because Elon Musk is a genius, and he's obviously a big uh, cultural influencer owning Twitter. So I think it's valid and interesting for him to have those conversations. But at the end of the day, if you delete the broadcaster side out of it, it's not going to be as compelling or easy to consume as a, a Rogan, you or I, having a conversation with Trump. Yeah, I 100%. And, you know, there are some people who do other things who just happen to be very good at broadcasting. Uh, David Sachs comes to mind. Like, he's really, really good to listen to on podcasts. He's just, he's a natural at it. And he's like a, a business guy. He's, you know what I mean? It's not like that's what he came up doing, but he's just very good at it. Elon Musk in, is brilliant, no question. But in interviews and, and, it, Look, typically he's the one being interviewed and he's not particularly great in interviews. And I, I will tell you, I've certainly learned over the years, it's a whole different skill to interview someone else. That's a, that's a, Even within broadcasting, there are people who are good at broadcasting who aren't particularly good at interviewing, like me. Uh, I try to work on it, but I'm not particularly good at that. And then there's people who are like phenomenal at, being an interviewer like rogan is just like incredible at it and people a, a lot of times it's a weird skill being an interviewer because if you're really good at it uh people don't even notice 
like that that's almost like the the skill is to make it so like almost like you're kind of not even there in a in a weird way you know what i mean and so people don't know but i'm telling you it is a skill it is a real skill to be a good interviewer i don't i you know most of this to me at least not particularly great at that um also twitter spaces always at least in my experience i always feel like voices sound weird on them and i did think there was a little bit of a an issue with with that there there were some good things that donald trump said in it he got in there that he wanted to abolish the department of education so that was pretty cool i didn't you know it's almost this was a an old republican talking point that republicans used to say they were going to do they used to always say they were going to balance the budget and abolish the department of home uh, uh excuse me not homeland security they didn't typically say that of education um they never did it and I don't think Donald Trump's going to do it either, but it's hey, at least good to be said and put it out there. Um, so anyway, there were some there were some cool parts. I will say the part that stood out to me the most was um, his talk about his assassination attempt. Um, I wanted to play a clip of that and then uh, uh, discuss it a little bit. It starts out with Donald Trump kind of saying the things we've heard him say before. Um the you know the ear bleeds so much i don't know he keeps saying this but it's not like it didn't seem like he was gushing blood uh, anyway um but and he was kind of talking about the crowd and how sad it was that that firefighter got killed but I, I was interested when the conversation turned to the secret service so let's let's play this uh let, let's open with this a little bit from the uh from the twitter spaces last night are breaking every record in the book tonight that's great well, thank you. Um, well, here let's start at uh, at uh, seven minutes. Start off with um... uh, Kamala, sniper they call him, or sharpshooter, but sniper yeah. because he didn't know there was a problem. Uh, he's been he's an extraordinary shot, obviously, and he didn't know there was a problem. And he yeah. was able to pick it all out within five seconds, and he used one bullet from very far away. I guess probably about four hundred yards. The shooter was 130, but he was on the uh, yeah. uh, he was on the opposite side of the field and the podium, and he saw the the smoke and the flame from the gun, immediately recognized it, and immediately took a shot, and it was one perfect shot from very far away. And, and if he if he didn't yeah. do that, Elon, he would have, I mean, if he would have, a lot of people, a lot more people have been could have been sure. badly hurt and killed. So yeah, I, I, I have to take my hat off to him because that's also a surreal. You know, he's been with them for 23 years and there's, yeah. he's never had anything like this. And all of a sudden he has to act. And it's a very tough thing to sure. act and to be shooting somebody. But he saw the uh, he saw the gun, saw the smoke, saw the flame from the gun very far away. I obviously has very good eyes. He's got very good vision, which I assume you yeah. have to have in that particular work. But he uh, he Absolutely. took aim very quickly, and it was they say it was approximately five seconds from long range yeah. one bullet. If that didn't happen, because yeah. the shooter had a lot of bullets, he had a lot of a lot of cartridges sure. up there with him. So, well, it been very I mean, I mean that that, that that's clearly uh, uh, you know um, you know he was he was very confident in taking that shot uh, to stop the the assass the attempted at assassination. Um, uh, but but I mean there does seem to be I, I mean some pretty significant failings um, elsewhere in the system. Like there's just no way that like how on earth does a shooter get on a roof 130 yards away? Um, that seems crazy. Um, I think most people like are what, people are wondering how that how on earth could such a thing happen. Well, you know, I view it as two ways. Uh, there should have been nobody in the roof. Uh, there were people yeah. because there were so many tens of thousands of people there. There were people that were seeing him. And there was one woman with a red shirt and uh, right. Trump all over it. And, she, and she's screaming, and that guy's got a gun. You know, you saw it probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a no, guy up there with a gun. I mean, it's like, I'm just, I'm just, I guess, I mean, for my, for my part, and I think probably many members of the public are wondering how the heck are, you know, basically people wandering by it, pointing out there's a guy on the roof with a gun. Yeah. Um, and they're seeing it, but uh, somehow that's it's not being addressed. Um, that that does seem yeah, crazy. Well, they they're going to learn from this. The uh, communication between the local police, who sort of 
had an idea. And then ultimately, a man lifted himself up to the roof, could barely do it because, you know, he was pulling himself up. And yeah. he saw the man with the gun. The man with the gun pointed the gun at him. He thought he was probably going to get shot. But, you know, he was like pulling himself up. And because of that, he couldn't get to his gun. And he fell down, actually very badly hurt his uh, leg, his ankle. I hear very badly. But okay. but he fell down. And he did, you know, from what I understand, he did say there's a guy up there with a gun. And the the shooting started very quickly after that. I think it, I think it forced the shooter to go maybe quicker. You know, he was supposed to be a very good shot. Yeah. My sons, uh, Don and Eric, they, they can't believe what happened. But they said from 130 yards, a bad shot would hit that target almost every time. They said it's like in golf, yeah. sinking a two-foot putt. Yeah, it's, it's not a hot, it's not a no, tough shot. It's not a, it's um, not a long shot. The, okay, uh, we can, uh, service... we can, we can, we can end it there. Um, I, I gotta say, I was kind of surprised that Donald Trump is uh, kind of praising the Secret Service. His his choice is to just uh, praise the one guy who who did take the shooter out after shooting Trump in the head. And Donald Trump, of course, was only saved by m moving his head. And then several more shots rang out. And so he's praising that guy. It just seems strange to me that Donald Trump is not, like, seeming to have any criticism of the Secret Service or what exactly happened here. He doesn't seem to be, at least publicly, asking any of the questions that we would all have about this. Elon Musk, as you can tell in the interview, is asking, he's leading him in the direction of like, but the obvious? How about the obvious? What do you think about the obvious? Which is that they clearly allowed this to happen. I mean, in when I say the, they allowed this to happen, in one way or the other, they allowed this to happen. And Donald Trump does not seem particularly interested in getting to the bottom of that. Uh, I, I got to say, my initial takeaway from this is that um, I think Donald Trump is shook. Like, I I think he probably knows what happened here, and he's like, doesn't want to mess with it, which is kind of, a, if that is the case, a pretty important thing to note here. I don't know. What do you think, Rob? I'll play ball. What do I got to do? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys, uh, get the message. Don't shoot at me again. I, I was never really here. trying to. I was never <laughs> really trying to die. Just trying to win. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, don't know. I just like a wall. If I could just do that. <laughs> uh, no, I agree with you 100. percent There was an interview where him and JD Vance uh, were. I think it was on Fox, and they were pressing him on this a little bit, and he took the same tone of uh, praising this, uh, praising the Secret Service, and not asking the questions. And uh, it does not seem like. The fun Trump or the Trump that we'd like to see of, hey, the deep state tried to kill me. I'm going to yeah. figure out why. I no longer trust this. At first, they went after my last campaign with the Russia hoax. Then they tried to go after me with these court cases. When none of that worked, they actually tried to kill me. Now they're lying to you and pretending like Kamala Harris is filling stadiums. And that's why this is an important election. I need everyone to support me yeah. so we can drain the swamp. That's what he should be saying. But instead, he seems to be trying to, please, Deep State, I'll play nice this time. I learned my lesson. All right, guys, let's take a moment and thank our sponsor for today's show, which is Qualia Senolytic. Have you heard about Senolytics yet? It's a class of ingredients discovered less than 10 years ago, and they're being called the biggest discovery of our time for promoting healthy aging and enhancing your physical prime. Your life goals in your career and beyond require productivity, but let's be honest, the aging process is not our friend when it comes to endless energy and productivity. That's why you should check out Qualia Senolytic. As we age, everyone accumulates senescent cells in their body. Senescent cells cause symptoms of aging, such as aches and discomforts, slow workout recoveries, sluggish mental and physical energy associated with that middle age feeling. 
also known as zombie cells. They are old and worn out and not serving a useful function for our health anymore, but they are taking up space and nutrients from our healthy cells. Qualia Senolytic removes those worn out senescent cells to allow for the rest of them to thrive in the body. It just takes two days a month. The formula is non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, and the ingredients are meant to complement one another, factoring in the combined effects of all ingredients together. They have a 100-day money back guarantee. This clinically tested two-day rejuvenation regimen may hold the key to unlocking cellular health and revitalizing aging tissue throughout the body. So, resist aging at the cellular level. Try Qualia Senolytic right now. Go to qualialife.com slash problem for up to 50% off and use the promo code problem at checkout for an additional 15% off. For your convenience, Qualia Senolytic is also available at select GNC locations near you. That's Q-U-A-L-I-A-L-I-F-E dot com slash problem and use promo code problem for an extra 15% off your purchase. Thanks to Qualia for supporting today's episode. All right, let's get back into the show. It's I mean, look, it's not it's not even just what Donald Trump should be saying. Like I agree with you 100%. You're like dead on. But it's not just what he should be saying cuz there's lots of things that I'm like, "Oh, Donald Trump should be saying this, but to say this it might require that he had read a book about the subject and like he just doesn't know you know what I mean? Like a, a lot of things. And so th that's why he's not making this comment or whatever. But this is uh, Donald Trump always, always, and he's an expert at it, but he always flirts with conspiracies. This is what he's always done. And he knows exactly how, if there's one thing Donald Trump is a master of, he knows exactly how to say something without saying it. You know what I mean? Like where they'll just be like, uh, and people said they saw Muslims cheering after 9-11 and people will be like, there's no tape of anyone doing that. He goes, well, a lot of people say they saw it. You know, I'm like, kind of like, well, I didn't say that. I said, people said that kind of deal. But whether it was, I mean, I don't know. Do you even remember Rob, before he was running for president, he went on the, the huge birther thing with Obama, where he was claiming he wasn't really uh, born in America. And a lot of people say, a lot of people say he wasn't born in America, you know, and then like, and then went on this whole thing where he offered money if they could produce this real birth certificate. And, you know, he's, he had talked before running for president, a lot of stuff about 9-11 uh, and the buildings coming down like that and how it looked kind of strange. And a lot of people think it was a controlled demolition. Um, he talked about how they lied us into war in Iraq, not just that he didn't have weapons of mass destruction, but that they were lying about it. Um, certainly uh, the spying on my campaign, the Russia hoax, um, the he's he certainly was very quick to say that they're weaponizing the Justice Department against me. Like all these things are like, you know, they are definitionally conspiracies. And yet with this one, like the most obvious one, you you would just kind of expect Donald Trump to at a at a minimum, uh, to borrow their term, kind of dog whistle it. You know what I mean? Which which by the way, I never. People always claimed he was dog whistling um, uh, racism. I never really thought that was true. I did think he was dog whistling conspiracy stuff a lot. Even when he would say, he would flat out say Obama created ISIS. He would. Uh, uh, Trump was never afraid of like you know, like winking and nodding at a conspiracy. And right here, you would think this is the most obvious one. By the way, I'm not like a, when I'm, I'm not saying conspiracy in like a pejorative, uh, like I'm, I'm a lot of these were conspiracy. The Russia hoax was a conspiracy and, you know, the weaponizing the justice department was a conspiracy. And this one sure looks like it could have been. And so it's just it it does seem wild that Donald Trump is going to sit here. So your story is they framed me for treason with Russia. They uh, they impeached me over nonsense. They weaponized the Justice Department against me. And then the Secret Service did a really great job. It was like and, and just on the face of it, it's like, did they did they do a really great job? Now, look, I you you got to try to, I, I guess understand that his security is still in their hands but 
You know, as as Tucker Carlson said to me the other day when we were talking about this, and it was it was like the way he put it was really so spot on. Where he goes, I, I was like, look, the the Secret Service allowed this to happen, and he goes, employees of Joe Biden allowed this to happen, and you're like, yeah, that's right, that's right. The people who work for the Biden administration allowed this to happen, and Donald Trump is not going to milk that a little bit. That's that is knowing Donald Trump and just looking at what just happened here. You got to admit that's kind of bizarre. And it does make you wonder, is Donald Trump scared? You know, there if you really want to drain the swamp. And this isn't like I'm not talking about like you're running for president uh, as a third party or something like that. Like, you know, when, when I was flirting with it or w when other people have run on the Green Party or the Libertarian Party, everybody who runs on the Libertarian Party ticket for president or the Green Party ticket for president or something like that, they all know they can't actually win. You, you're not really in the game of attempting to uh, gain and wield power. You're, you're in the game of attempting to spread a message. Now, it becomes a little bit of a tricky thing because you can't ever say that, you know? And I, I do kind of like, I, I empathize with those candidates when someone will ask them, point blank, can you win? And they're like, well, you never know. Crazy things can happen. Because it's very hard to say no, but please donate money to me. You know what I mean? Like it, it kind of is the evil of politics. It, it, it starts to make you a liar immediately. I tried my best even when I was flirting with it to never uh, do that. But th it's a, if you're actually saying, I want to get in, I'm, I'm running to win. I want to get the power of the presidency and I want to drain the swamp. In other words, I want to roll back the biggest honeypot in the history of humanity. You, you, if you actually wanted to have a shot of doing that, you would have to be ready to die. You would, ha you would have to be willing to die for your cause, which I do not, um, I don't say lightly. Uh, I, I'll be very clear with you guys. I am not ready to die. I, I believe in the things I believe in, but I'm not willing to die for them uh, if I have a say in that. I, I just, I have two little kids and may, maybe when they, if they were older and they were set up, uh, then, then maybe I would be, but I'm not willing to as long as I have little kids. And I think that Donald Trump, this probably never even crossed his mind would be my guess. You know, I've never met the guy. I don't know him at all. So I'm not like claiming that I know him in the same way. All of us know him, but I don't think even when he said that it ever really crossed his mind that like, if you were ever really to be in a position to do that, they will try to kill you. And I don't think that ever probably occurred to Donald Trump. You know, and, and even as they were like, even after everything they did to him, I, my guess would be that never really occurred to him. And I don't think Donald Trump is the type who is willing to die for what he believes in. I just don't. That's not my read on him. And it seems just to me like the most likely explanation here is that he's afraid. And that um, that in and of itself <sighs> Let's you know something here. Like if if it is true that he's just afraid that they'll do this again and he's willing to play ball, then you know, we're kind of right back to or, or you should be right back to where me and Rob have basically been this whole time, which is that the listen, there's the the value in Donald Trump is in in the message that he spreads in the overreaction that he provokes out of the out of the establishment and in terms of how he shapes um kind of the beliefs of his supporters but if you're if you're this afraid then you're not you're not going to get in and drain any swamps that's just not going to happen I don't know. I, what do you think, Rob? I, I mean, I agree with everything you said. It's a little bit like that Bill Hicks uh, joke that they that you get into office and you see the JFK assassination from the other angle. Mm -hmm. um, it, also, speaking to your initial point, that was Donald Trump's superpower 
was dictating the entire news cycle with these outrageous claims that were kind of just questions. And then everyone would go, wait, Donald Trump is claiming this. And it would get repeated and repeated and repeated. And he would dictate the news cycle by making these crazy claims. And they were interesting. So everyone would talk about it. Uh, I It seems to me like Donald Trump is shook. I've always uh, been of the mentality that I think most of these deals get cut behind closed doors. And so the idea that he's cut deals or is willing to play ball is very much so in the scope of uh, at least the way the movie plays out in my head. I guess the only thing I'll give him credit for is that perhaps uh, perhaps this just happened. And as he gets closer to the election and maybe he's not out campaigning as much, maybe he'll change his tone. And maybe there's a little bit of safety in actually winning. And so he doesn't have to care about his safety for as long. Um, but everything I'm seeing thus far is it seems like he's uh, pretty shooken up and has lost a lot of his mojo. Yeah, I, I mean, I look, I really agree with you. And um, I, I think that, like, I stand by everything I've said about the Harris Walls ticket. I, I think they're, it's totally fake. I don't think any of their support is authentic or any of it's real. But it is just getting harder and harder to ignore the fact that Donald Trump just does not have that 2016 magic. It, it just doesn't have that anymore. He's not um, he's not positioning himself as that guy who you were describing, like the guy who really is just so starkly out side of the establishment and the guy who is like i'm the middle finger to the establishment what it's not just that donald trump would dictate the the news cycle it's that with donald trump and i really do think this was all instinctual but what he he had an unbelievable ability to um to say a kind of common sense thing in an incredibly provocative manner that would like drive the corporate media crazy. And then they would repeat it over and over again. But actually, as it landed on voters' ears, they were kind of like, eh. you know what I mean? Like, you'd be like, well, I don't know. Yeah, you know, Mexico's not sending their best, they're sending rapists and, and drug dealers and stuff. And then, like, they'd be like, Can you believe that he said this about them? And a lot of people would be like, oh, 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 are a lot of drug dealers coming up from that. You know what I mean? Like it would just kind of and and this was just like a perfect opportunity to do that. Where you know, they they would all been like, Can you believe he's spreading these conspiracy theories? And then people would be like, It does look pretty damn odd that the guy you've been trying to take out by any means necessary. You then allowed a guy with a sniper to get on a roof 130 yards away from him while people in the crowd. are. It's almost like like Donald Trump himself starts talking about how people in the crowd were yelling. He's got a gun and a cop had confronted him and all of this. And like, like he's still allowed to to fire off these bullets. It's just it, it's like, look, I, I don't know, uh, you know. But it just seems so it, it's at least on the face of it. Like, you know, um when uh um you if you watch like Law and Order or something like that, you know when they're deciding whether or not they have enough evidence to go to trial? Like it at least seems like it like you're at least there. You're at least like, oh, we're going to trial. <laughs> like there's there's yeah, you guys allowed this to happen. We're going to trial to see what exactly happened. Oh, you the the regime has a clear history of trying to take this guy out, and then you allowed a guy to try to take him out. And it just like it can't be overstated enough how much how much it's just because he turned his head. How you know, like you were that close to it, and you're not, you know, like look again, perhaps. Donald Trump is, you know, for 4D chess or whatever. Perhaps he's secretly really working on getting to the bottom of this and he doesn't feel like he can say it out loud. But then again, ask yourself, does that sound like Donald Trump at all? <laughs> Keeping something to himself and not just blurting it out? He's he's incapable of that on everything else. So I just, it seems to me like the, the answer here is that, that they're, this guy might be, in effect, compromised. I guess we'll find. Uh, I guess we'll find out, or we won't find out. But we'll at least uh, see how it plays out from here. It's uh, 
I don't know. It just seemed that to me of the entire uh, the entire Twitter spaces, that was the moment to me that stuck out the most. We know that Donald Trump will play ball because of the McConnell, I believe it was Edward Snowden incident, um, where basically McConnell, when he was leaving, said, hey, you can't. I, I'm trying to remember this, but he, he basically said you can't pardon Snowden. Uh, and if you do, I forgot what the consequence was going to be. It was something. It was the do... impeachment. It was they that they were right. going to vote to in, uh, impeach him or whatever. It's the the impeachment that happened over January sixth, not the right. Ukraine. And, and I bet the threat was a little bit more like you're going to have hell to pay if you do that. And uh, and and Trump even referenced it later because recently it came up and he had said that there were uh, a lot of people on both sides and the different issues and you know he was kind of telling you that people told me hey this is important to us that we don't we don't release you so i'm just saying trump's kind of, listen he's a businessman and he's definitely in this to win and for his own interests and his interests might be aligned with your interests at times but at the end of the day he'll cut the deals that he needs to cut and he won't piss off the deep state when he knows that it's not a winnable fight um and i think in the mcconnell thing was probably more of a threat of uh whether or not the republicans were gonna get on board with getting him in trouble for January 6th and all that other yeah. nonsense. Uh, the point just being the idea that after this incident, he didn't finally call whoever that person he needed to call was and go, all right, how do I shift my tone so that you guys don't try and kill me again? All right, what's yep. the, is it Israel? Is, do I have to support that and stop talking about the deep state? What is it that, what's the deal that I got to cut so that you guys don't shoot at me anymore? And at least that, uh, I, I'm not saying that that's definitely the reality, but it does feel like the flavor. Well, I, I would also just I agree. And I would also just add to this that, look, I'm not claiming that the, the president sees everything, but there's no question that Donald Trump had access to a lot of classified stuff, you know, and, and he had what supposedly he has the highest level of clearance as the president of the United States. I don't know how real that is or isn't, but I will say that uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, who I have a great deal of trust in, he's not the type of guy who would just say something like this. And he was a, a friend of, of President Trump's and he's publicly talked about this. So I'm not like giving anything away that he said to me in confidence or something like that. But he... Um, so Donald Trump had promised to release the uh, the JFK files, and then he didn't do it. And Judge Napolitano said he called them. They were on the phone while he was president, or Trump called Napolitano while he was president. And while he had him on the phone, he asked him, and he said, you know, um, Mr. President, you know, you said you were going to release these, uh, declassify these JFK files. Like, that would be a really great thing to do. And uh, and what Judge Napolitano said, it was something I forget the exact thing he said, but he basically said something uh, to the judge. Like, if you had seen what I've seen, you wouldn't release him either. And the judge was like, well, what have you seen? And he said, uh, he said, I'll have to tell you sometime when there's not uh, 17 other people on the call. Ray Epps is a time traveling Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, all all I'm saying is that my suspicion is that Donald Trump is well aware that they've done this before. And once that bullet whizzed by his head, he probably put together that that is what they were trying to do to him. And I think we're seeing how he's responding to that now. So... I don't know. All very interesting to me. Obviously, I'm speculating a bit, but anyway, uh, that's where we are. All right, let's uh, let's and, let's and for move. the sake of uh, avoiding sure, sure. any defamation suits, I don't actually know anything about Elon Musk's relationship with Nigeria. I pulled that one out of my ass. Yeah, that was all. This is all jokes. <laughs> all jokes, kids. We don't we don't mean any of this stuff. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's play the uh, the um, CNN lady whose name I don't know. On uh, on the uh, Colbert report, or geez, not the Colbert report, on uh, on the Late Show with Stephen Colbert. This this was a classic moment. Trump has kind of been thrown on his heels by this, and he's not really sure how to go after Vice President Harris. He knew his attack lines on, on President Biden. 
he really has struggled with how to how to go after someone who's 20 years younger than him, who is a different gender, a different race. It's kind of been this moment where he has not been able to coalesce around a single attack line. I know you guys are objective over there that you just report the news as it is. <laughs> oh, I know. CNN makes it. Is well, that supposed to be a laugh line? It wasn't supposed to be, but uh, I guess it is. Trump has kind of been thrown. Wow. This is just an amazing moment. Just an amazing moment here. I mean, here you have this uh, CNN lady who is uh, evidently on her way to a nightclub. I'm not exactly sure why she's dressed like a, a slutty 20-year-old girl. This is like kind of bizarre. I don't know. I find it very bizarre. It's very, it's very bizarre. They do it at Fox News all the time, too. Like, is that, are you supposed to be a newswoman? What the hell is this? Anyway, he literally just says, you guys are objective over there. And the whole crowd almost involuntarily just cracks up laughing at it. Well, what a beautiful moment. And then she's kind of like, well, why is that a punchline? And he's like, it wasn't supposed to be a punchline. And it goes, oh, maybe your crowd isn't quite as stupid as we've all thought they were all these years. That was pretty beautiful. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, it's just a little moment, but it's going super viral for a reason. What did you think about that, Rob? I guess they uh, stopped keeping the unvaxxed out of studio, so it's not as easy for them <laughs> to sling the straight propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> ah, shit, that's such a great take. Yeah, I guess that is. I guess they let some people who haven't, uh, you know, had their uh, their third virus on their sixth shot in uh, into the studio audience. Pretty... I thought a pretty incredible uh, moment that it was because it was almost just so funny. It's so absurd to um, to describe the, the CNN coverage of Donald Trump as objective. Like, you know, goddamn, by the way, there is something about I remember. So I. Uh, I remember around like 2016-ish time when, if you can remember how much like wokeism was almost like at its peak and there wasn't as much of like a counter movement to it or that like kind of started to grow around there. But it's, uh, I, I remember just seeing out of comedians, I'm sure you remember this too, Rob, because you were right with me at the time, like on in the comedy scene where it's like, all the comedians who would just be saying the like whatever the the politically correct woke thing was to say and it, there's something about comedians doing it that just is so disgusting like i i don't know if maybe, maybe it's because this is what we do but it was always kind of like i mean being a comic you, the thing about it was always that it's like oh i don't have to do any of that bullshit I don't have to just say the thing that the people say, this is the appropriate thing to say. It's like, no, we get to say the inappropriate thing to say. That's part of the fun. And so there's something, but just being Stephen Colbert and you're going to turn over and like, oh, to just sit here and say something as ridiculous as CNN is objective. I mean, like, I don't even, I, I'm not saying you got to support Donald Trump. Uh, that's not the argument I've ever made. I've never been a Trump supporter. I'm not saying you got to be a left winger or you got to be a right winger or anything like that. But to just, I mean, to, doesn't it just hurt your soul to just like lie through your teeth just to get a pat on the head from the establishment, especially when you've already got more money than you'll ever spend? Like, why? It'd turn over and go, I mean, if there's anything, we all know CNN's coverage of Donald Trump is totally not biased at all, right? Like, I, I mean, I, I don't care who you are. I don't care what, where on the political spectrum you fall. No one, everyone knows CNN is an objective when it comes to Donald Trump. Even if you think they're objective in any way, which, spoiler alert, they're not. When it comes to Donald Trump, you think they're an objective news source? This is why your audience is laughing. That's a hilarious thing to imply, let alone explicitly say. 
Gosh. All right, guys, let's take a moment and thank our sponsor for today's show, which is one of our favorites, Sheath Underwear. And we have a chance for you to win a year's supply of Sheath Underwear. Save goodbye to those old pairs and step your game up to Sheath, just like me, the only underwear that I own. If you want to say goodbye to all of those awful boxer briefs that you've used in the past and win a full year's supply, 14 pairs of Sheath Underwear, don't go through another hot summer without the cool and comfortable Sheath Underwear. Click the link in the episode description to enter and get exclusive deals from sheath.com. Once again, step your game up, just like me and all the people over here, all the guys at Gas Digital Network and the Legion of Skanks, we all wear sheathunderwear.com. In all seriousness, the most comfortable pair of boxer briefs you will ever own and a great company that supported this show for a long time. If you want to step your game up, click the link in the episode description for a chance to win a year's supply of Sheath and get exclusive deals and discounts from Sheath, the official underwear of the Part of the Problem podcast. Make sure you go over to sheath.com and use the promo code PROBLEM20. That'll also get you 20% off your entire order. All right, let's get back into the show. Yeah, well, it's also fun because uh, I guess this lady must have a good publicist. We've watched uh, three segments, I think, on this show of politicians or other people being on her show and her just getting wrecked. Uh, she's not particularly the smoothest or the slickest, but she mm-hmm. is who I guess is kind of like their new Don Lemon character or who they're trying to make out to be their big star and promote. And so I'm sure CNN got her place. So uh, I, I think just even her just being there is what allows to set up for like these moments where you're trying to play along but cnn's not a great news source she's not some superstar or a great journalist and so the more that you're forced to try and sit there and play into that reality uh the more opportunities you have for an entire audience people to just laugh and be like this is absurd yeah yeah i mean look it really is it's just look the idea of it is so absurd that even uh colbert's you know like where where is he in la i assume no, I think he's in New York. He, is he, he in New York? Over, he's in where Letterman's. Oh yeah, that's was. right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Letterman was always in New York. That's right. Um, so even, but even in front of a New York like progressive audience, even they just couldn't even help it. It's just it's it's hilarious. It's just too ridiculous of a thing to say. If I had to guess, you get a. It's a probably a fair amount of tourists. It's probably your people coming through Broadway, and if you could snag your free tickets while you're on yeah, vacation, you're probably right. Yeah, and I'm sure there's some New Yorkers, but I bet there's I bet it's 70 percent people on vacation were able to snag the free tickets, which is a win. It's, you know, middle of the afternoon, you get to go see Colbert over a Broadway show for free. Yeah, no, I guess that's true. Although it does seem like his audience seems to like the mindless nonsense he's been spewing at them for years now. So even wherever they're getting them from, they're somewhat on board if they're laughing while he does his get the vaccine dance or whatever dumb shit he's doing these days. That's such a shame. He used to be so goddamn good. <laughs> I swear. I'm like young people. I probably, I know you won't believe me, but he was really, really good. Once upon a time, he well, was these late night hosts change when they take that annual outing to Epstein's Island. <laughs> <laughs> they sure do. They Just sure do. Come Something they the come same. back. They come back all different. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Um, all right, let's uh, let, let's move over to this. This was another clip. You actually sent this to me. I had not seen this. I thought this was uh, kind of interesting. Um, so what, uh, I'm sorry, what network was, oh, this is CNN. Okay, yes. All right, so um, there's uh, um, uh, one of Harris's uh, campaign spokeswomen, uh, uh, Adrian uh, Elrod. She was on, uh, on CNN and she was asked uh, some questions about um, Kamala Harris. And uh, it was pretty interesting, her response. So let's go, uh, let's go to that clip. What's on the vice president's schedule today? Uh, well, she's traveling and talking to voters and getting her message out there to the American people, something that she's been doing from the very start of this campaign and something that she certainly did when she was uh, President Biden's running mate as vice president. Uh, but look, you just mentioned the speech she's going to be giving. But, but, in, uh, in but that's right. I, was, I, I was asking about today and I don't think she's got any campaign events on the schedule today, does she? Well, she and Governor Walls have been traveling across the country. They hit nearly every battleground state last week. On the campaign trail, they raised $36 million within mm-hmm. the first 24 hours of uh, Governor Walls joining the ticket. And what she's going to be doing Friday is taking her economic message directly to the voters in North Carolina. I certainly don't want to get in, in front of exactly what she's going to say, 
Uh, but she's going to talk a little bit about how she's going to make sure that she's putting consumers first um, as part of her economic plan. She's going to take on uh, corporate price gougers. She's going to take on junk fees. Uh, and that's something that, you know, John, she did when she was attorney general of California, something she continued to do as the United States Senator of California. So All right. she's going to be taking that message out to voters. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing what she more of what she's going to say on Friday. I think we all do. And I'll ask you more about that in just a second. The reason I was asking about today is because it seems like she has time if she wanted to do an interview uh, with a member of the media or do a news conference. Correct. There does appear to be that time if she wanted. Well, look, she has said on the campaign trail that she would be doing an interview at some point. Um, she said that, I think, last week during um, dur during a rope line or when she was talking to uh, reporters. But look, what is important here, John, is that she is taking her message directly to the American people. She had a number of battleground states. I think we had 15,000 people in Detroit last week, uh, 12 to 13,000 in Nevada. She's been taking her message to the voters and drawing large crowds. So she's actually having those direct conversations. But not today. The no, whole thing is not, to, not, not today. She could do an interview today, I would think, you know, uh, because she's not out there today. I, well, look, she could, she, she's t taking her message directly to voters. And uh, just because she doesn't have any, anything, an interview schedule on her public schedule doesn't mean that she's not taking her message directly to voters. About well, there you have it. Um, she's taking her message directly to voters. Um, translation she's reading off a teleprompter that now it, it is pretty well see look even as um as as corrupt uh, as the corporate media is and as much as they are essentially campaign surrogates for kamala harris at this point they will get offended by this because they like to be part of the show and the the pathetic response of she has said on the campaign trail that she will do an interview at some point like that that's it look there's a dynamic with kamala harris and i will be the first one to admit that i do not understand it uh completely uh i felt like i had a much better understanding of joe biden as many of us do it's pretty obvious the guy's brain doesn't work you know and it, it, over the last few years, it kind of comes and goes. It seems like it's going a lot more than it's coming these days. But Joe Biden might forget what you're talking about. He might start a sentence and have a lot of trouble completing it. This could happen at any moment. Uh, he struggled in interviews as much as he struggled reading the teleprompter. With Kamala Harris, that's not exactly the issue. Um, and she is capable of reading off of a teleprompter. She can do that. You know, so she can go up on stage. She can walk without looking like her legs are made out of stilts and she probably won't fall and she probably won't just stutter to death or lose her train of thought or stare off into the sun as if she has no idea where she is. Those are unique problems to Joe Biden. Um, but she is very, very bad off the cuff. And if you look at any of these moments that Kamala uh, Harris has had over the last four years where she seems like a, a retarded person um, where she, you know, just the, the moments where she's just uh, it, like, I, I, I've said to you before, like she sounds like she ate a 3000 milligram edible and it just kicked in and she's happen. just, huh? We've seen that happen. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm saying like where she's just talking about how space is all around us and it's everywhere. And the wonderment of space is that it's so wonderful. And, you know, like all that stuff that doesn't happen when she's reading a teleprompter. But it has happened a lot when she's going off the cuff. And it seems like they're trying to avoid that. I don't know exactly like how bad it is. Uh, or, or like whether she's capable of getting through interviews without doing that. Um, but I do know that almost all of those moments have come when she's not reading a teleprompter. Um, and when she's not, uh, you know, just, just delivering prepared remarks, it's more like when she gets asked a question, like, why haven't you been to the border? And she just starts cackling and says, why haven't I been to Europe? And you're like, whoa, that was awful, you know? Because, like, 
the border is part of our country. That's well, that, 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 that why it's different. Even worse because he literally asks, "Why haven't you been to the border?" She goes, "I have been to the border," and he goes, "No, you haven't." And then she goes, "Well, you might as well ask me why I haven't been to Europe," and starts laughing. Yeah, it's like, whoa, this is really, really bad. And so it's funny. It, it's amazing that they can spin this as like she's talking directly to voters, even though yeah, that's it's not true. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it, like giving she's, a she's speech. She's talking to the people they hired to show up in mass. Where's that budget? <laughs> that's who she's you're, talking to. She's talking to AI generated images. That's for sure. <laughs> but. Like, I'm just saying, I don't even know. I don't know if that's real or not. But uh, but um, there is something about, like, why is, like, why exactly is it that getting on stage in, in front of an audience uh, and reading remarks off a teleprompter is talking directly to voters, yet sitting down for an interview, what, isn't talking directly to voters? Like, who do you imagine is listening to that interview uh children below the age of 18 and foreigners i i mean it, presumably there would be some voters who would be listening to what you're saying so why exactly is that not talking to voters anyway it's uh this is an interesting moment because it does kind of reveal the uh apprehension on the Harris campaign about putting her in a situation where she may not be able to deliver um, prepared remarks and she may actually have to think something that she doesn't seem to be uh, very good at. We're going to do the thing we did with Biden where the only time people can ask him stuff is over the sounds of a helicopter. So that way you don't know what he's saying. Uh, yeah. It, and it, by the way, this has been a, a, a big issue that they keep reporting on that she hasn't taken any interviews. And I think you're right. It's that CNN's like, hey, at the end of the day, we need some ratings here. And the whole thing that gives us credibility is the fact that we like that's the game that we're playing is that we give you favorable reporting and you guys actually give us we access. get access. Yeah, yeah. We, we're making a trade here. Like we're on. I mean, it almost like a, it, it's almost like the position of CNN is like, hey, listen, like. It's like you hired me for a job and I haven't gotten a paycheck yet, you know? It's like, hey, we have this deal of like we trade favorable coverage for access and you're telling me we don't get our access? That's not the deal. And so clearly like it, it this is fascinating because it is kind of in a weird way like a chink in the armor of the way that this, you know, corrupt establishment works is that it's like no, no, this is the trade. You have to make this trade. And that actually might put her in a situation where she does have to do it. If you're uh, if you're on the Trump campaign or a Trump voter or a, a Bobby Kennedy voter or anything like that, man, you want Kamala Harris in as many interviews as possible. Because that is, again, where she has really historically struggled. Um, the late night shows, literally every appearance that you put her on is an opportunity for a Biden-esque blunder of, oh, this person has dementia. She is unlikable and not intelligent. And the more times we roll her in front of a camera, the higher the odds are of a campaign ending incident. It is really uh, unbelievable with the amount of power that the establishment has and how big a country this is and how many, look, I'm not saying we all have our flaws and none of us are like, you know, perfect. But the idea that these candidates consistently have such glaring holes in their game, that it's something like this, where it's like, I don't know that. Look, the thing is, it's not, she's not senile. She's not Joe Biden, but what Kamala Harris is, is, um, she dumb. is yes she's it she's dumb she's totally unimpressive she has no depth or knowledge to her at all i mean at all there's like no subject that she can speak on and and demonstrate a depth of knowledge at all um she's not she's also intensely bizarre and unlikable like the the it's like in order to compensate for all of these qualities, she'll just cackle. Like it's it's very weird, a very uh, um, off-putting person. 
And so, yeah, they're worried about like even even something like you said, like a late night show, which is not at all a hostile interview. She will just be so unappealing in it. She's just everything about it. I mean, do you remember um, what was it when she was on CNN and she comes out for that town hall and the first thing she says is like, her pronouns are she, her. It's like, does this like... And I'm wearing pa- a blue suit. It covers <laughs> yeah, like my it, arms. Yeah, it's like this pathetic thing where she's like, um, it, it does, she has the feel of like a, a robot who's supposed to be doing an impression of a person. And that, you know, it. it uh, anyway, I guess the point really is that it's it's going to be next to impossible for them to not let that Kamala Harris come out throughout the campaign. And there's still there's still a few months to go here. I, I don't see how they're going to avoid that. I also I, I just kind of love the grilling for over a day off with the amount of days off these people traditionally take. Like if this is my campaign manager after a weekend of shows, if you asked, I'd be like, yeah, he was doing shows all weekend. He's taking a day to watch porn and eat cake. Uh, <laughs> Just getting his strength back. He'll be back out there tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, I guess they can't say that, Rob. Right. For some reason, they didn't feel comfortable going with that. Hey, before we uh, before we wrap up the show, I did you had you had put this on our uh, list of things to talk about, and I did think it was worth bringing well, up. We, but isn't it? We got uh, to take some live comments. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll pull up uh, the comments. But so let's uh, but let's just mention this because you had you had brought this up, and I had seen this, and and it really is uh, I think worth mentioning but isn't it interesting that kamala harris has adopted the policy that donald trump adopted from ron paul of uh no tax on on tips that's the new uh that that's i guess something that both candidates uh can agree on well what i'm hoping this leads to is a tick for tack where usually everyone's trying to offer more free goods or at a minimum, uh, low interest rates to create credit asset bubbles that might blow up on another person. Uh, but playing the game of who they won't tax, that sounds like a game I'd like to see these politicians play. Start start scratching off other sectors. Usually you just got to go to the unions or whoever else to try and buy some votes, give some free college, give some free this, give some free that. Give us back our tax money. Let's play this game amongst the politicians. Yeah, well, I got to say, I like this game a lot more. <laughs> if we're going to give out stuff, how about the the stuff that belongs to you? Just let you keep it. Um, it is, look, part of the reason why I love this, um, number one, it's, I mean, when the Democrats are, are talking about it, it's particularly entertaining. But the thing about not taxing tips, which obviously... I completely support. Obviously, you completely support it too, Rob. Um, but that's also because we have at least a basic understanding of economics, which is pretty rare. Um, and so whatever any any decrease in taxes is is good, and I'm behind it. But it does just it almost in a weird way just ha- like it is if as long as you have two brain cells to rub together. You don't even have to have that many more. But if you got two, one may not be enough because there's nothing to rub against. But if you have two brain cells that you can rub together, it does just kind of open Pandora's box. You know what I mean? Like you just start to look at it and you go like, yeah, oh, wow. Okay, that would be enormously helpful for people who work on tips and pay taxes on those tips, right? I mean, that that would be like, that'd be huge. I mean, if you're whatever your you know the job is where you're you're making tips, if you're paying taxes on those tips, I mean, I have to imagine that there's still a lot of people don't pay taxes on tips, right? And certainly, I think when you get cash tips, I highly doubt that most people are reporting those tips or reporting them in full. But I suppose a lot of people are getting tips on credit cards these days. And okay, so that that would be a big deal. But then you also go like. Okay, well, right away, I mean, lots of, let's say uh, restaurants, right? That's a pretty tip-heavy environment. Um, you you tend to have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the name of the person who just brings you to your table again? The waiter? No, 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 uh, not the, the person uh, who brings you. The, the hostess. 
Yes, the hostess. That's right. So typically you have a hostess who makes an hourly wage, um, and then you have servers who rely on tips. Now, traditionally speaking, the server is like a step up from a hostess. Like they're making more money, right? Like typically the hostess is just making like a little hourly wage, but if it's a busy place, the servers can clean up on tips. Is there like right away you're like, well, why does, how come she has to pay taxes? But they don't have to pay taxes. It doesn't seem, uh, maybe that was sexist of me. It could be a dude. Uh, but it does seem like it's more often a woman who, or a girl who is the hostess. But like, right. So it just, it's like right away. Also, like, look, being like a bartender or being a server, these are just the jobs I'm thinking of that are very tip heavy jobs. Um, they tend to be not bad gigs. Like, you know, I mean, it, it might be really bad if you work at a place that's empty, but it tends to be one of the reasons why people like uh, actors and comedians and stuff, a lot of them have jobs as bartenders or or as uh, waiters or waitresses is because it's like, oh, it's one of those day jobs where like you could actually make more money than you can doing a lot of other shitty jobs. You know, if you work at a place that's busy, you could, you could make decent money uh, on tips. So it's like, if they shouldn't get taxed, like if they shouldn't be taxed, why just because they work on tips should they not be taxed? But why, why is it like what's the coherent argument for why hourly wages should be taxed yet tips shouldn't? Essentially, it seems to me that the argument is that uh, people who work on tips aren't typically making a ton of money. So why should they pay taxes? It's like, okay, great. Let's apply that all around, right? And then you could recognize that it's like, ah, I don't know, even someone who's someone making 75 grand a year who's got a family, why the hell should they be paying taxes? It's just I just like the conversation. I like the, the again, as we mentioned, when Donald Trump first came out with this policy, I just love the idea of like this is like it's like finding the easiest, most popular thing to run on, which just involves the government not doing anything. It just opens the conversation up to how much people are screwed over by the government in general. It's like, oh, how could they, how can this organization help you? How can this organization that robs 40 to 50% of your income from you every year, how, how could they help you? And you're like, oh, this just dawned on me. Stop. Stop doing that. That might help. I don't know. Any, any final thoughts, Rob? No, let's take a, let's take a couple comments. All right. All right. What do we got here? Um, uh, CTG writes, uh, 43 states still pay income tax. Uh, so I don't see how, uh, half the nation doesn't pay income tax. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Um, uh, Barry writes, uh, what do you think is the most effective strategy for libertarians to influence policy in a political landscape dominated by two major parties? Oh, that is a good uh, question. Um, I don't know that I would say there's one uh, most effective strategy necessarily. I mean, I, like I, the I running the gayest guy we have. I, that's what you got to do. Yeah. Run your gayest guy. And, and so, that'll, uh, that'll that's, get some... what, that's what we're trying this time. And we'll see how it goes. Well, look, obviously, like, um, like the Libertarian Party is, you know, largely embarked on a, a strategy of kind of trying to pressure Trump into taking more libertarian positions. Um, and they've pretty remarkably, you know, and the credit is to Angela McArdle on that. It is pretty remarkable that they've gotten some promises out of him. Now, look, promises from any politician are only worth so much, but you kind of got to start somewhere. And, you know, if, you know, th there's a lot of possibilities of what that could lead to. So I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I think that obviously like my, my strategy has been to, you know, get myself in front of the biggest audiences that I can and try to tell the truth in the most compelling way that I can and that hopefully move the needle that way that, you know, there is like the pressure from that voters can put on politicians and not even just voters, but just 
because they're people of that country. Um, and politicians always know on some gut level that they're greatly outnumbered by the people they rule over. So that's kind of what I'm in the game of. But I certainly think that like the Free State Project in New Hampshire, they have this strategy of uh, um, like geographic concentration. I think there's there's been certainly a lot of um, there's been beneficial outcomes already for that. New Hampshire is one of, if not the freest state in the union. That seems to be pretty good. I I also think you know, um, pulling your kids out of government school is a is a great place to start. But that's just me. All right, let, let's take one more, and then I do have to uh, uh, wrap up. Um, uh, Dave, thoughts on the uh, DD uh, OS attack before the spaces yesterday? Yeah, I don't listen, man. I just don't know. Literally, the extent of my knowledge on that is that Elon Musk said it happened. I don't even know if that's really what happened or what, but that was kind of, that's what Elon Musk said was the reason why the Twitter space like got shut down, but then they restarted it and it, and it seemed to go off without a problem. So if if it was some type of attack, it didn't seem tremendously effective, I guess would be what I would say, but I don't I really don't know anything beyond that. Well, there you go. That's a good way to wrap up. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> All right, listen, thanks everybody uh, uh, for watching and um, thanks uh, uh, particularly to everybody who's already signed up at partoftheproblem.com. If that's not you, come join the cool kids over at partoftheproblem.com. And of course, come see me and Robin Stamford at New York Comedy Club on Thursday night. Looking forward to that one. All right, thanks for listening, guys. Peace.